Today's final event will be a series of readings from the letters of Rosa Luxemburg by New York actress Kathleen Chalfant. For those of you who are not that familiar with the namesake and inspiration of our foundation, I want to briefly introduce her. Rosa Luxemburg was born in Eastern Poland in 1879, the, the year of German unification, the first one. For, yeah, 1871. For all of her life, she, be, she belonged to the disadvantaged to the persecuted minorities for birth, for reasons of both birth and fate. First, she was Jewish and she couldn't escape anti-Semitism even though she had no interest in religion. Second, she was Polish and as a Pole, she was, she was subjected to both German and Russian rule. But at the same time, her indomitable will led her to determine the course of her life. Contrary to the narrow conventions of her time, as a woman, a lover, as a scholar, a writer, and as a socialist. Rosa Luxemburg was the shining star of the European socialist movement. As a member of the Social Democratic Party and active participant in the Second International, she was deeply committed to changing the world on behalf of the exploited and disadvantaged. She was an outspoken critique of German militarism and struggle to prevent World War I. Rosa Luxemburg was deeply disappointed about how the national parties of the Second International overnight changed their attitude and sided with their national governments instead of with their fellow workers. The feeling of betrayal, however, and her imprisonment during the war from 1914 to 1918 did not change her commitment to criticizing capitalism and fighting the war. Rosa Luxemburg welcomed the Russian Revolution with hope, but as a revolutionary Democrat, she remained critical and alert. With great prescience, she attacked the Bolsheviks' dictatorial policies from the very, very early on. Freedom is always the freedom of the one who thinks differently, she famously wrote. For Luxembourg, social equality and political freedom must always go hand in hand. After the Kaiser had stepped down and Luxembourg had been released from prison, she began taking part in the founding of the Communist Party of Germany. Though deeply inspired by what many felt was a revolution underway, Luxembourg remained cautious about its immediate prospects and was actually opposed to the revolt begun in Berlin in January 1919. On January 15, 1919, she was beaten to death by murderers in uniform, people who were part of the same crowd that would later openly support handing power over to the Nazis. As a public figure, Rosa Luxemburg left and to this day continues to leave no room for indifference. She lived out her convictions loudly and without compromise, with human warmth and an intoxicating temperament. And her fate is inseparably linked to the radical, democratic, socialist tradition. No. I can't go on working. The thought of you keeps distracting me. I must write you a few words. Dearest, most beloved, you are not with me now, yet my entire soul is filled with you and it embraces you. To you, it will certainly seem monstrous, perhaps even comical that I'm writing you this letter when we live 10 steps apart. 
see each other three times a day, and besides, I'm your wife, after all. So why all this romanticism, writing a letter at night to your own husband? Oh, my golden one, let it seem comical to the whole world, only not to you. At least read this letter seriously and with your heart, with the same feeling that you read my letters back then in Geneva when I was not yet your wife. Because I'm writing it with the same strong feelings as then, and my whole soul impels me toward you in exactly the same way. My eyes overflow with tears. Giorgio, my love, do you know why I'm writing you this letter and stay, instead of saying all of this to you in person? Because I don't know how. I'm not able to talk with you so freely about these things anymore. Right now, I'm as touchy and skittish as a hare. Your slightest gesture or inconsequential remark makes my heart shrink and seals my mouth. I can speak with you as openly as this only if I feel surrounded by a warm, trusting atmosphere, and that tends to happen so rarely between us now. I've had so many thoughts to share with you, but you were distracted, though cheerful, and you didn't feel you wanted anything physical. In other words, you thought that's all I was concerned about at that moment. That hurt me so much. You thought I was just feeling dissatisfied because you were in a hurry to set off on your trip. Perhaps I might not even have had the nerve to write this letter now, but at our parting you brought up a whiff of the past, that past in memory of which every night before going to sleep I almost choke among the pillows from my tears. My dear, my love, no doubt you're already glancing around. What in the world does she want? Do I know what I really want? I want to love you. I want the same gentle, trusting, ideal atmosphere to exist between us as existed back then. You, my dear, often understand me too superficially. You think I'm always sulking because you're going away or something like that. And you can't imagine that it hurts me deeply that for you, our relationship is something totally external. Oh, don't say, my love, that I don't understand. That it's not just an outward formality the way I think it is. I know. I understand what it means. I understand it because I feel. I have a very good sense of what this outward formality really is. I feel it when I see how gloomy you are and without speaking you busy yourself with something, any other concerns or even with unpleasant things and your look tells me it's none of your affair. Go mind your own business. I feel it when I see how you, when we have quarrels on a bigger scale, take these impressions to heart and mull them over and you think about our relationship and you arrive at one or another conclusion and you quickly make some decision or other and in some way, in spite of everything, I am left behind. I feel it after every time we are together when you shove me aside afterwards and close yourself off in your work. I feel it in conclusion if in my thoughts I reveal my whole past life and my whole future, in which I envision myself as a mannequin activated by some internal mechanism. My dear one, my love, I am not complaining. I am not asking for anything. All I want is that you not interpret any weeping on my part as just the scenes that women put on. Do I know what the situation is after all? I'm certainly very much to blame for it. Perhaps the most to blame for the fact that no warm and well-balanced relationship prevails between us. But what can I do? I don't know. I don't know how to behave. I can't get control over the way I am in our relationship. I don't know how to do it. I'm not take, capable of taking firm hold of the situation. I'm not capable of drawing conclusions. I'm not capable of taking a particular firm position in relation to you. At any moment, I behave the way inspiration or impulse dictates. So much love and suffering have accumulated in my soul that I throw myself at you, throw my arms around your neck, and your coldness pains me. It tears at my soul, and I 
hate you for it. And I feel I could kill you. My golden one, after all, you are capable of reasoning and comprehending. You've always done that, both for you and for me in our relationship. Why is it that now you don't want to do it together with me? Why do you leave me all by myself? Oh, my God. I'm turning to you and appealing to you so much that maybe, as a result, it's become true. What more and more often seems to me to be so that perhaps you don't love me so much anymore, do you? Truly, truly, I feel that so often. Oh my God, what's the use of talking about it? It's pointless. And again, my dear, you will ask, after all, what is it that I want? I want nothing. Nothing, my precious. Only that you should know that I, even with the personality I have, am not tormenting you so blindly and unfeelingly. I want you to know that I weep often and bitterly because of this. And once again, I don't understand it. I don't know how to behave or what I should do to help myself. Sometimes I think it would be best to see you as seldom as possible. At other times I pop up in good spirits again and would like to forget it all and throw myself in your arms and cry my heart out. But then this cursed thought comes again and whispers to me, leave him in peace. He puts up with all of it only out of politeness, from wanting to be tactful. Then two or three small things immediately confirm this thought, and hatred wells up in me, and I like to torment you, to bite you, to show you that I don't need your love, that I too would be ready to do without you. Then again, I torment myself and grieve all alone, and so it goes endlessly in a vicious cycle. Dear friend, what a misery this is. I feel the need to chat with you, and now I don't even have a small piece of letter paper. You'll have to be satisfied with this. It's late in the evening. I'm sitting in a rocking chair at my desk on which stands a lamp with a large red lampshade that I made myself, and I'm reading Burner. In front of me, the door to the balcony is open and a fresh breeze is blowing in. There's a glaring flash of lightning from time to time as a storm is brewing. God forgive me for this prose poem of wretched quality, but that's certainly the way things are at times when there's loneliness. Just think, in this huge city of Berlin with two and a half million inhabitants, not a single friend. At this moment, I am so content with this thought that I even have a complacent smile on my face. Perhaps you're surprised that I'm reading Old Berner. I haven't met a German yet who would still want to read him, but he always has a powerful effect on me and always awakens fresh thoughts and lively feelings. Do you know what gives me no peace nowadays? I'm dissatisfied with the form and manner in which people in the party, for the most part, write their articles. It's all so conventional, so wooden, so stereotyped. Nowadays, the words of a burner sound as though they're coming from another world. I, I know, of course, that the world is different now and different times, want to hear different songs, but it is precisely these current songs from our tribe of scribblers, which for the most part are no songs at all, but just a droning without color or tone like the sound of a cogwheel spinning in a machine. I believe that the source of this lies in the fact that people, when they're writing, forget for the most part to go deeper inside themselves and experience the full import and truth of what they're writing. I believe that people need to live in the subject matter fully and really experience it every time, every day, with every article they write. 
and then words will be found that are fresh, that come from the heart and go to the heart instead of the old familiar phrases. But people are so used to one or another truth or verity that they prattle or spout about the deepest and greatest subjects as though they were mumbling a paternoster. I hereby vow never to forget when I'm writing to be inspired again on each occasion about what I'm writing and to go inside myself for that. That's exactly why I read from time to time old Berna. He reminds me faithfully of the oath I have sworn. One more thought for me. I cannot stand Berlin and the Prussians. And I will never be able to tolerate them. I warmly press your hand, your Rusha. Dear Carl, naturally I will forego publication of my declaration in the Neue Zeit. Uh, uh, allow, allow me to add a few words of explanation. If I were one of those who defend their own rights and interests ruthlessly with no consideration for others, and in our party the number of such people is legion, or rather everyone in the party is like that, I would naturally insist on publication because you yourself concede that as editor, you have an obligation toward me in this case. However, since at the same time you acknowledge this obligation of yours to me, you put a pistol to my chest with the most friendly warnings and pleadings that I should not make use of this obligation of yours or this right of mine, and it makes me sick to the stomach to employ my rights when someone will only provide those rights with a great groaning and gnashing of teeth, and at the same time with every word I say in my defense that person falls on my arms and tries to tie me up, stating that I should defend myself, but trying in every way to talk me out of it and move me toward renouncing my rights, you have accomplished what you wanted. I release you, in this case, from your obligation toward me. But in doing this, you are, to all appearances, making a mistake, claiming in all seriousness that you believe you have dealt with me, in this case, only out of friendship and in my interest. Permit me to destroy this self-deception of yours. As a friend, you would have had to say something approximately like the following. I advise you unconditionally and at all costs to protect your honor as a writer, because great writers and men with reputations solidly established for decades, such as Marx and Engels, wrote entire booklets, waged entire wars of the pen when anyone dared to accuse them of the slightest falsification. All the more should you, in such a case, seek to obtain complete satisfaction because you are a young writer with a lot of enemies. As a friend, that is certainly how you would have had to speak. The friend, however, allowed the editor of Neue Zeit to take over. And since the party congress, that editor has wanted only one thing. He wants to have peace. He wants to show that the Neue Zeit has become well-behaved after the drubbing it received and is now holding its tongue, and therefore the proper rights of a contributor to Neue Zeit to defend her most important interest, her right to defend against public slander, may be sacrificed. Thus it is that someone who works for the Neue Zeit, not in the least important position, and not the worst contributor, will have to swallow a public accusation of falsification because only in that way will peace reign in all the treetops. That is the way things stand, my friend. And now I send you cordial greetings. <laughs> Your Rosa. Beloved Henriette, how good that both of you exist, 
Sometimes when things get dark and dreary for my soul from all sorts of garbage in life, particularly party life, I remember Amsterdam and things brighten up again. You say that I see Holland too much through rose-colored glasses. Oh, but let me have this illusion, at least in relation to a pair of good people. It's so fine to have a pure and fragrant memory kept in stock. But why the devil am I moaning to you in such a melancholy way? Don't believe it. Don't believe me in general. I'm different at every moment, and life is made up only of moments. With regard to your wish for a quotation regarding strikes, you're probably not thinking about classical economics, but about bourgeois economics in general. The classical authors, Locke, Petty, Smith, Ricardo, etc., do not yet have anything directly about strikes. It was not until the 20s of the 19th century that economists began to deal with them after the big conflicts in England. And so, what you need is first to be found, as I recall, in Thornton on labor and perhaps in Sismondi. I don't own these books, unfortunately, and, and I have commissioned a friend who has access to the Royal Library to search for the quotation. If, if something appropriate turns up, you will get it promptly. I, I think you need this for your pamphlet on the general strike. I, I don't <coughs> sorry, want to talk with you solely about the race problem in social democracy, but would much rather talk about our general situation at present. In particular, I am by no means delighted by the role so-called orthodox radicalism has played up to now, tracking down instances of opportunist stupidity and repeating parrot-like our criticisms of them is for me not a satisfying form of labor. But rather, I am so thoroughly fed up with this duty that I prefer to remain silent in such cases. I'm amazed at the certainty with which many of our radical friends contend that the only thing necessary is to constantly bring the sheep that has gone astray, the party, back home to its stall. Firmness of principle. And in this connection, I feel that with this purely negative activity, we are not making any steps forward. And for a revolutionary movement, not to go forward means to fall back. The only means of fighting opportunism in a radical way is to keep going forward oneself, to develop tactics further, to intensify the revolutionary aspects of the movement. Generally speaking, opportunism is a plant that grows in swamps, spreading quickly and luxuriantly in the stagnant water of the movement. When the current flows swiftly and strongly, it dies away by itself. It is precisely here in Germany that there is an urgent, burning need for the movement to go forward. And the smallest number of us are aware of that. Some get bogged down in petty squabbles with the opportunists, and others, indeed, believe that the automatic mechanical growth of our numbers in elections and in our organization in and of itself means moving forward. They forget that quantity must be transformed into quality that a party of three million cannot keep carrying out the same automatic operations performed by a party of a million and a half. I don't know, need to tell you that I'm not thinking about any sudden going into the streets or any kind of artificial adventurism, but our entire work must be given a different, deeper tone. Consciousness of our own strength must be raised and Ah, and we'll talk all this over sometime, otherwise I'll be turning this letter into a lead article. Do you also think along these lines sometimes? This is not at all just a German problem, but an international one. The Amsterdam Congress made me very clearly aware of that. But German social democracy must give the signal and point the direction. My, my impressions from Amsterdam, I mean the Congress, gave me a lot to think about. And the final result is that it would be highly useful to encourage a closer coming together and above all, a getting to know one another among the individual parties. I do see the strengthening, strengthening of international feeling to be in and of itself a means of fighting against bigotry and ignorance on which such a goodly part of opportunism rests. And I find that our press, including Neue Zeit, for example, is not free of its share of blame in this respect. I've frequently said and written this to Kautsky. 
Obviously, by himself, he can't do much, but a personality like you, my blonde Madonna, could have a great effect. If, if you don't have the time yourself to inform Germany now and then about your movement, you would at least have to arrange this matter, organize it, and direct it. Because after all, it's not a matter of merely reporting dry facts, which, for example, Vorwärts does with a notable absence of inspiration, but <clears throat> It's a matter of conveying the living spirit of the movement. What you wrote me about the demonstration by young sailors gladdened my heart and refreshed my spirit. It was necessary for the Kautskys to learn about this for the first time from me, from Zwickau prison. There was not one word about it in our press. For my part, I intend to study the Dutch movement diligently and will make use of my next visit to you for that purpose. I hope to find you a good and kind Cicero. Naturally, for this, I will quickly learn Dutch. In, in the prison cell, I unfortunately had no instructional aids. I tried to read Dutch, but understood only every fifth or sixth word. To make up for it, I read a lot of Italian. <laughs> because that movement, too, has aroused my interest. Which language would be best for getting to know the Scandinavians better? The triumvirate of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden is quite unattractive to me. And when I see the good man Knudsen, I can easily believe that Denmark does a big herring business, but I find it difficult to imagine that Prince Hamlet was born in that country. <laughs> but one must certainly become better acquainted with these three dreadful parties because, as was shown again at Amsterdam, they do play a role in the international, even if not a gratifying one. Yours completely, Rosa L. My dearest, most favorite people, I haven't let you hear from me for a long time and you're probably feeling resentful, and rightly so, but I have as justification for myself the unending hurly-burly and the insecurity of existence that one constantly suffers from here I, I, I can't very well describe the details now, but the main things are enormous difficulties with getting things printed, arrests every day, and threats of the firing squad for those who have been arrested. Two of our comrades had this Damocles sword hanging over their head for days, but it seems that the danger has passed. In spite of everything, work is proceeding cheerfully. Big factory meetings are taking place, new leaflet, leaflets are rented, written and printed almost every day, and our newspaper, though with moaning and groaning, comes out almost every day. A small conference has just taken place in Finland in which all parties participated. This was a new edition of the old idea of a block, and of course was a washout. In this connection, one at least had a closer opportunity to get a look at things in St. Petersburg. Uh, un unfortunately, the scene presented there is a real mockery of the latest news reports from St. Petersburg in the Leipziger Volkszeitung. Indescribable chaos in the organization. Factional collapse despite all the talk of unification and general depression. Let let's keep this just between us. And by the way, don't take it too tragically. As soon as a fresh wave of events comes, the people there will also move forward more strongly and briskly. The only unfortunate thing is that they are always so vacillating and so little capable of standing on their own feet. The family gathering will take place somewhat later than was originally intended. At any rate, many thanks for, greeting, for the greeting from the elders which I will deliver when the time comes. But to pick up the threads again, unemployment, voila la plaie de la révolution. There is no means of controlling it. At the same time, a silent heroism and a feeling of class solidarity among the masses is developing, which I would like to show to the dear Germans everywhere. The workers are making certain arrangements on their own initiative. So that, for example, the employed workers regularly take up a weekly collection for the unemployed. 
or where employment has been reduced to four days a week, they arrange things so that no one is left out, but everyone works at least a few hours a day. All this is done so smoothly and self-reliantly that it was only incidentally that information about it was given to the Bharti. In fact, the feeling of solidarity and even of brotherhood with the Russian workers has developed so, so strongly that one is involuntarily amazed even though we ourselves have worked toward that goal. So then, here is an interesting experience from the revolution in all the factories on their own initiative. Committees have been formed by the workers that make decisions about all conditions of work. The hiring and firing of workers, etc. The employer has literally ceased to be master in his own home. <coughs> For the time being, the work accomplished by the revolution of deepening class contradictions and sharpening and clarifying relationships has been enormous. And from outside the country, when one cannot see all this at all, people think that the struggle is over, when in fact it has gone down into the depths. And at the same time, the organization is making forward steps tirelessly. In spite of martial law, the trade unions of social democracy have been built solidly with all the formalities, printed membership booklets, stamps, bylaws, regular meetings, etc. The work is being carried out completely as though political freedom already existed. And naturally, the police are powerless against this mass movement. In Lotz, for example, we already have six thousand members signed up in the Social Democratic Trade Union for textile workers. Here in Warsaw, we have 700 bricklayers, 600 bakers, etc. In St. Petersburg, the work has reportedly returned entirely to underground conditions, and for that reason, it has also come to a stop. They are absolutely incapable there of publishing even a flyer or a leaflet or a newspaper. Absolutely. I would like to be there to get to the bottom of all that. Unfortunately, I have to close already, and I have one more request. Dear Carolus, please send 1,600 marks from the main account in the form of a check made out to Otto Engelmann and send it by registered mail to the address I previously gave you. It's urgent. A thousand kisses and best wishes to all of you, particularly to you, dearest Lulu. Write me very soon. Your R. Beloved, I already wrote you that your letter was intercepted by Leo. Yesterday, things came to a brief and soft-spoken but frightening confrontation during a trip on an omnibus. Without any mention of the letter, we were talking about my intention of leaving tomorrow. L won't let me go and declares that he would sooner kill me. I'll be staying here even if in a hospital. We went directly into an elegant restaurant where my brother was expecting me for dinner. A fine orchestra was playing in the gallery, music from the last scene of Carmen, and while they were playing, El softly whispered to me, I would sooner strike you dead. Bobby, I don't know what's going to happen to me in, 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 in the days ahead or with my departure or in general what will become of me. I feel a strange calm and this quiet conflict which perhaps will be the death of me. It makes my pulse beat in a lively way, almost joyfully. As stated, I know nothing. Only one thing I do know. I've become dreadfully anxious about you Beloved little Bobby, be on your guard. You still have your whole life ahead of you. I would like it best if I knew you were in Sillenbuch, in the large shadowy forest which would enfold you protectively and caressingly. This evening, Elle wants to go from here to my brother's in order to have better control over me, and is, it is therefore possible 
that I won't manage to drop you another line before my departure. So be calm, beloved, be calm. Do you hear, little booby? You must be calm and cheerful. Go frequently in the days ahead to see Gertrude, because I will at any rate notify her by telegram of my arrival, but don't come to the station unless I telegraph you directly, because otherwise I won't be coming alone. I kiss you many thousand times. When your letter came, I was just about to send you a telegram to ask why I had been so long without news. The report about the conception foot put forward by D gave me the distressing certainty that the clarification of views will be much more difficult than I had already assumed. The distinction between the good-hearted people who approve the war and the evil-hearted ones, between the war patriots without chauvinism and those with chauvinism, is all right for evaluating people personally. But unfortunately, it's not appropriate as a political line of orientation. In this matter, where we are talking about the vital nerve center, the to be or not to be of international socialism, nuances in the approval of war cannot have decisive weight. Dividing people according to whether they approved out of necessity or did so with a joyful heart isn't worth a pinch of powder. This is shown by the fact that not one person will admit that he voted for any reason other than being under coercion, being placed before a fait accompli. No judgment can be made about motives in cases of such world historical significance, only about actions. On top of that, almost every one of the approvers presents a slightly different motivation, so that not just two, but six or eight different groups can be distinguished. And thus, the supposed line of demarcation disappears in the sand. The reproaches one wants to make against those in the, on the right only involve the degree of consistency in their approval of the war. And thus, the distinction proposed by D in the final analysis boils down to that between a consistent pro-war policy or one that is not consistent. I am, under all circumstances, in favor of consistency, but I expect nothing but wretchedness from the notion of swallowing approval of the war and may consistency be damned. I will telegraph you to say when I'm coming, and you can inform O and D in good time. Nota bene, immediately confirmed by telegram the receipt of this letter. Dear Carl, I take the opportunity to send you a few lines by a roundabout route. Above all, many thanks for the newspaper that I also do not receive at home anymore. Nowadays, it's a refreshing comfort to have a social democratic paper in front of one's face that speaks in the good old way. From the party press here, what one gets most often is nausea. In reply to my two postcards, I've not yet received any word from you. I, I assume you did write, but the answer didn't reach me. At the present time, every greeting and every sign of life from co-thinkers in other countries is doubly precious. Here we feel ourselves to be cut off from the world, blocked off, in fact, by a double wall, the state of siege and the party officialdom. For your information and for the information of other friends, but not for publication. Let it be said only that it would be a great error to think that the official behavior of the Reichstag group, the SPD executive, and the party editors express the thoughts and feelings of the whole party. On the contrary, a growing bitterness is observable on all sides. How far this bitterness extends, which side has the majority, cannot now be determined, even approximately, since it is precisely the opponents of the official party tactics whose mouths are gagged, and the political life of the masses is completely suppressed. Also, the mood is shifting more and more. Many 
who favored voting for the war credits have since then, in the face of subsequent developments, been overtaken by healthy fears, and now they are opponents of this policy, or will be tomorrow. At the same time, another group of comrades, with each passing day, are backsliding most blatantly, following in the wake of the national patriotic government policy. Thus, the internal development of the party in the midst of the war, although hidden from observation, is undergoing an unstoppable process in which different elements are being sheared off. On the one side, elements actually belonging to the bourgeois camp, who at best would constitute a reformist workers' party subservient to the military with a strong nationalist streak. And on the other side, elements who do not want to abandon the core principles of revolutionary class struggle and internationalism. This silent internal struggle has already begun, although we really did not want to take up the struggle under such unfavorable conditions. Mutual distrust and mutual hatred, however, can scarcely be concealed and are already evident as tiny flames flickering on the surface. No one hides it from himself that as soon, himself, that as, soon as the war and the state of siege have ended, the internal disagreements will break out with tremendous force. And still less would anyone hope that the highly prized unity of the party could be preserved when there is such a deep going internal rift. It is only the state of siege and the war that artificially shore up the supposed party unity. There is no doubt about it. German socialism and international socialism as well are going through a crisis as never before in history and have been placed before a fateful question by this war. If, after the war, international socialism does not succeed in rejecting imperialism and militarism in all their forms, a real and proper rejection that is meant seriously this time, and that would apply even in the event of war, then socialism can let itself be buried. Or rather, it will have buried itself already. The process of clarification after the war will decide the to be or not to be of socialism. But precisely because this process is of such immense world historical importance, it would be important that no hasty, ill-considered steps be undertaken on the part of the international, steps that would to some extent move in the direction of calling a meeting of the International Bureau or conference as soon as possible. Because as of now, only one of two things could result. Either the representatives of the different countries would angrily quarrel and refuse to hear any justifications from one another, which would at any rate provide sad documentary evidence of the collapse of the international, or, on the other hand, all the representatives from the countries at war, perhaps with the blessing of the neutrals, would grant pardons to one another for the atrocities that have been committed and declare in the spirit of mutual toleration that each party understands that the other could not have acted otherwise. That would be even more fatal because while preserving the international or rather a hypocritical semblance of an international, it would actually mean the burial of international socialism. So would be better that no attempt to artificially patch up the international be made, not before firm and solid foundations have been laid. <clears throat> and this can only be done by an internal clarification process. One must first allow us time in Germany itself to determine what the party is thinking in its majority and where it stands in regard to the war. <coughs> The same can be done by the French, English, Italians, etc. Then the international would know where it stands and how it can be rebuilt. All forced attempts to tie together the threads of the international right now, as soon as possible, could only result in a hypocritical slapdash job if they did not move in an even more harmful direction, like the trips being made to neutral countries from Berlin and Vienna, which have the explicit purpose of solidifying the neutrals in the interests of the German-Austrian military leadership and of putting other countries in a mood favorable to Germany and Austria. When all is said and done, our situation here inside the party is very sad. 
And every day, one must pull together all one's strength and courage in order to wade further through this morass. Beloved Lulu, your short letter before Easter, because of its extremely depressed tone, troubled me deeply, and I've immediately taken it upon myself to drill some sense into your head once again. Tell me, how can you possibly keep singing your little song of woe like some unhappy cicada when such a bright chorus of lark songs is ringing out from Russia? Don't you realize it is our own cause that is winning out triumphantly there. That world history in person is fighting her battles there and dancing the Carmagnole drunk with joy. When our common cause is going forward so well, must not all our private miseries be forgotten? I, I know it saddens you that I'm not free right now to gather up the sparks that are flying about over there to help and to provide direction there and elsewhere. Certainly that would be a fine thing. And you can imagine how every part of me is itching to do that. And every bit of news from there hits me like an electric shock that I feel all the way to my fingertips. But my not being able to take part doesn't get me down, not one bit. <clears throat> you see, I've just learned from the history of the past few years, and looking farther back, from history as a whole, that one should not overestimate the impact or effect that one individual can have. Fundamentally, the powerful, unseen, plutonic forces in the depths are at work, and they are decisive, and in the end, Everything straightens itself out, so to speak, of its own accord. But don't get me wrong. I'm not pronouncing my word in favor of a cheap, fatalistic optimism, which only seeks to veil its impotence, the kind of outlook that, precisely in the case of your esteemed spouse, is so hateful to me. No. No. I am ready at my post at all times and at the first opportunity will begin striking the key of world history's piano with all ten fingers so that it will really boom. But since right now I happen to be on leave from world history, <laughs> not through any fault of my own but because of external um, compulsion, I just laugh to myself and rejoice that things are moving ahead without me. And I believe with rock hard certainty that all will go well. History always knows how to manage for the best, even when it seems to have run into a blind alley of the most hopeless kind. Dearest, when one has the bad habit of looking for a drop of poison in any blossom, one finds good reason as long as one lives to be moaning and groaning. If you take the opposite approach and look for the honey in every blossom, then you'll always find reason to be cheerful. Besides, believe me, the time that I, and others as well, spend behind bars, under lock and key, will not be in vain. In the great overall settling of accounts, this too will somehow prove to be of value. I am of the opinion that one should, without trying to be too crafty or racking one's brains too much, Simply live the way one feels is right and not always expect to be repaid immediately with cash in hand. I am enjoying life so much. Every morning I thoroughly inspect the condition of the buds on all my bushes and every day I visit a little red ladybug with two black spots on its back which in spite of the wind and the cold I've been keeping alive for a week on a little bough warmly surrounded by cotton wool. And I observe the clouds, how they are constantly being renewed and becoming ever more beautiful. And on the whole, I feel that I am no more important than the ladybug. And I am inexpressibly happy with this sense of my insignificance. Above all, 
the clouds. What an inexhaustible source of enchantment for a pair of human eyes. Yesterday, Saturday, around five in the afternoon, I stood leaning against the wire fence that separates my little garden from the rest of the prison yard. I let the sun shine on my back and looked east. There, a large cloud formation was piling up against the pale blue background of the sky. Its color was of the most tender gray, and above it there was a light glimmering of pink, as if some force from behind had breathed it out. The prison yard was empty, and as always, I was alone, a stranger to everything around me. From the open windows of the prison came the thumping and knocking sounds of Saturday's scrubbing and scouring, and now and then a loud, reprimanding voice could be heard. Meanwhile, the chaffinch, way up high in the poplar tree, kept repeating its bird call over and over, and the trunk of the poplar tree, which is still quite bare and leafless, gave off a silvery gleam in the slanted rays of the departing sun. Everything breathed of such peace, and my gaze was fixed on the softly smiling cloud formation far off there in the sky. I stood there as though enchanted, and I thought to myself, and to all of you, do you not see how beautiful the world is? Do you not have eyes as I do, and a heart like I do? to rejoice in it all. A heartfelt embrace to you from your R. Dearest Clara, today I received your detailed letter, finally got around to reading it in peace and quiet, and what's still more incredible to answering it. It is impossible to describe the way of life that I and, and all, all of us have been living for weeks, the tumult and turmoil, the constant changing of liver, living quarters, the never-ending reports filled with alarm, and in between the tense strain of work, conferences, etc., etc. I literally could not find time to write you. I've only seen my own place now and then for a couple of hours at night. Perhaps tonight I will succeed in writing this letter, only I really, I really don't know how to begin. I have so much to tell you. <clears throat> well then, first of all, as far as non-participation in the elections is concerned, you overestimate enormously the scope and consequences of this decision. There are no Rulerites, and Ruler was by no means a leader at the conference. Our defeat was only the triumph of a rather childish, half-baked, one-dimensional radicalism, but that was only at the beginning of the conference. In its later course, the feeling between us of the central leadership and the delegates was restored to a sound basis. And when I returned briefly to the question of participation in the elections during my report, I already felt quite a different resonance than at the beginning. Don't forget that the Spartacists are for the most part a fresh new generation, free of the stupefying traditions of the grand old party tried and true. And that must be viewed in both its aspects of light and shade. We all decided unanimously not to make too big an issue of this point and not to take it too tragically. In reality, the question of the National Assembly will be shoved into the background by the storm of events, and if the course of events continues as it has so far, it will prove to be highly questionable whether things will even reach the point of elections in a National Assembly. My first impulse when I read your letter and your telegram about the elections questions was to send you a telegram, come here quick as you can. I am certain that one week stay here and direct participation in our activities and consultations would be enough to establish complete conformity between you and us in each and every respect. Now, however, I see myself obliged to say the opposite to you. Wait a little while about coming here until we have quieter times again to some extent. To live in the present turmoil and hourly danger, the constant changing of living quarters, the strain and the rushing around is not for you. I hope in a week or so that the situation will have clarified itself in one way or another and regular work will again be possible. 
Nota bene. We have not taken any Borkhardians into the organization. On the contrary, Borkhardt was expelled from the international communists, and indeed that was done on our demand. <coughs> For the most part, the communists were from Hamburg and Bremen. On the whole, our movement is developing splendidly, and throughout all of Germany at that. The split from the USPD had become absolutely unavoidable for political reasons because even if the people were the, still the same as at Gotha, nevertheless the situation has become totally different. The severe political crises that we've experienced here in Berlin during all of the past two weeks or even longer have blocked the way to the systematic organizational work of training our recruits. But at the same time, these events are a tremendous school for the masses. And finally, one must take history as it comes, whatever course it takes. At this moment, in Berlin, the battles are continuing. Many of our brave lads have fallen. Meyer, Ledebour, and we fear Leo have been arrested. For today, I have to close. I embrace you a thousand times. Your R.